Uh, so hello everyone, uh, my name is Jacek. Uh, I'm gonna say a few words about myself in a few seconds. Um, I'm gonna speak about the global regulation of decentralized finance, uh, which is just a few thoughts on this topic. Uh, we are not able to cover the topic in full in uh, 30 or 45 minutes. Uh, so this will be just a few thoughts I had this morning when I was making these slides. And before I, I'm gonna say something about myself, um, I just arrived half an hour ago here. So I have a very limited idea who's in front of me, uh, except the people, many people that I know. So let me ask you a few questions. Um, the first one being, uh, do we have any uh, developers, not just technical, but like generally developers of DeFi projects here? Hands up like people that are working on, on DeFi in any way. Okay, <laughs> quite a few. Right, and now, um, uh, where are you based? I mean, what jurisdictions, what, what, what country are you working from? Uh, UK, hands up. Okay, like 10 people. Uh, EU, excluding UK. Okay, like 15. Uh, US or North, Af North America. Just a few. Asia, anyone? No one, oh, one person, great. Um, and last question perhaps, do we have any lawyers in the room? All right, quite a few, that's really cool. So now, uh, when I know a bit more about you, I can say a few words about myself. So uh, my name is Jacek Czarnecki. Um, I, I've been involved in the crypto space and blockchain for five years now. I just, I just read and never looked back. Um, and these are, uh, on the slide, you can see a few affiliations. Uh, the, the, like, you know, the top ones are, are a bit more important, the, the, the bottom ones are a bit less. So first of all, I'm a global legal at, at Maker, uh, the dominant player in the DeFi space. Uh, but uh, I'm also a board member at MAMA. Um, Chain Asset Managers Association based out of Switzerland, and there will be a MAMA panel just after the lunch break. So I invite everyone to, to, to join this, um, at this session. Uh, I, I just couldn't resist mentioning this, that I graduated from Oxford, which is not far away from here. And I also uh, got into Harvard, but so far I, I just didn't have time to, to, to go there to pursue a degree because I'm so much involved uh, and busy with, with DeFi. And I'm also working on, on setting up a blog, uh, defi.law. It will probably take me, me a moment, uh, but it should be it should be it should be up in a few weeks or months. And I'm also a Lego fan. I just wanted to mention that uh, perhaps someone knows where the Lego store in London is because that's that's what I'm gonna do still today. So, and uh, a few a few reservations. Of course, um, <clears throat> I, I am a lawyer, but not your lawyer. Uh, what I'm gonna say is it, it, it won't be any type of legal advice. I will keep everything on a very general level and also I will speak about many jurisdictions. So also that's why you, you, you just cannot uh, you know, make any conclusions in, in your specific case. Uh, and also views are my own. So I, I, right now I'm just representing myself. Of course, what I do, my affiliation that you know, they, they are uh, the main source of, of my experience and knowledge. Uh, yet, I, I'm just gonna speak um, for for myself only. Uh, so I'm gonna I, I divided this 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 presentation into two parts. Uh, the first one about regulation, the second one about DeFi. And first, I'm gonna I'm gonna talk a bit about the the legal thinking that is that is gonna be perhaps probably uh, quite truly in my opinion um, uh, relevant for for DeFi. So uh, first of all. Uh, I just wanted to say that, you know, in the presentation title, I mentioned global regulation. But there is a valid question, is there anything like that? Is there a global regulation on financial markets? And here I want to refer to a certain piece of legal history, uh, which not everyone may be aware of, but I think that everyone um, Knows, knows how the world is working today. We have the world that consists of many sovereign jurisdictions that are setting their own laws. And this is the legacy of at least the Treaty of Westphalia in, in, in the middle of the 17th century. You may know the, uh, the rule whose, whose realm his religion. 
And this is still true, right? I mean, the countries are just, just adopting their own laws. This is what they do. And they, they do not have to care about what's, what, what are the laws in any other country, right? Uh, so there are, there's, there's even no mechanism at the global level to adopt something like global regulation. Uh, countries can cooperate uh, with each other, but they are equal in this game, at least theoretically. Legally, they are equal, no matter if that's Marshall Islands with 50,000 uh, participants who, are, who want to have their own token, being their sovereign currency, or if that's the US, which is, which is a very strong player uh, globally, as we all know. Uh, and one more thing uh, that I'm that I'm repeating all the time that this is this is how lawyers think about the universe, right? This is the the world uh, that that lawyers see when they look into into uh, into the like in, into into the um, the earth. This is about uh, you know many plots of land divided with something similar to this uh, dry stone. Dresden Walls, I think that's Ireland or, or maybe England. Um, and of course, these plots of lands that are divided from each other, these are countries, right? Again, they are, you know, governing themselves, they are sovereign, they are setting their own laws. They do not have to care about what kind of laws that we have elsewhere. Uh, which, of course, brings a lot of questions in the, in the digital, digital space in general, right? We, we, already, we already see um, these problems, these types of problems with the internet. And now with, with blockchains and, and taking the cyberspace to, to an even higher level, this is uh, a, like even more uh, evident that you know this is not necessarily this, this is not necessarily the best match this, this type of this type of vision of reality, and having blockchains and DeFi, which is a global phenomenon. So the answer is 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 pretty short. Uh, there is no globally applicable regulation on financial markets. But that doesn't mean that there is no cooperation between jurisdictions, between these equals. Um, because, um, you know, uh, they are also free to cooperate, right? And to, to, to agree on certain matters or certain approaches. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna come back to that in a second. Uh, but first, uh, a certain exception, because like the vision that I just presented, would it be, uh, you know, it would be, too, too good to be, to be, to be uh, true, so, such a simple vision. So sometimes we have um, uh, something that we can call ex extraterritorial reach of laws. Uh, and this is why, this is at least one of the reasons why everyone in the blockchain space and then in the DeFi space in particular is so concerned about what Americans say about, about regulation, right? Because their law, they, it has, like they have this very specific approach um, of being able to go extraterritorial, like claiming jurisdiction over certain topics or activities, even though the link to the US it is not so obvious, right? For example, a certain activity is being conducted by players outside the US, right? But there is certain link to the US. And perhaps the most uh, striking example of this um, was uh, a court, uh, court ruling in the US uh, in, in the Tezos case. And you can see that highlighted in yellow. Not sure if that's that's visible. So the court uh, was was you know um, was was saying why it thinks that it has jurisdiction over this case, uh, over this um, you know talk token offering that that took place. But you know it was not so obvious if it took place in the U.S. If there is this in, like sufficient link to, to this jurisdiction, and the court the court provided a few reasons why it thinks that there is this sufficient link. And one of those was that these transactions as part of the token sale. Uh, were validated by a network of global nodes clustered more densely in the United States than in any other country. That was not the sufficient reason for the court to, 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 um, to conclude that it has jurisdiction over this case, but that's very, that's very significant, right? That when faced with this, with this old reality, we can see that courts will be using arguments of, of, of that type, or authorities will be using author arguments of that type to claim that they have jurisdiction over something that we might think it's global, right? This is Ethereum, this is a global network that is not related to any particular country, yet we have a number of nodes in the US, and this is why the US law applies. And of course, this is a strong oversimplification, but you, you, can feel, you can feel what I'm talking about, like just sometimes you don't, you don't need to care just about laws that apply in your jurisdiction, right? In the country you're based in. You need, to, you need to remember about this extraterritorial reach. And just another example from outside uh, financial markets is GDPR, right? Which, which do not, like either do not have 
uh, does not have this um, this like absolute extrater extraterritorial reach. It doesn't mean that everyone should be like is subject to GDPR and and and, and this this regulation and all the requirements that are in there. But at the same time, there is there is quite a broad language in GDPR that says about uh, when uh, uh, exactly GDPR applies. And many you know players around the world, many uh, companies, uh, many projects are just funding themselves under GDPR, even though the link is not so obvious. So does it mean that there is no cooperation between countries? And I already provided an provided, uh, uh, answer to this. Uh, the answer is no. And primary example that is very relevant, especially for, for the DeFi space, uh, is standard setting bodies. You can see quite a few on, on the slide here. Um, this is IOSCO, um, uh, FATF, FSB, OECD, and a few others, which are a kind of most often intergovernmental or international organizations that are uh, set up by the international community of sovereign states to deal with certain topics. And you can see that the, you know, the, the, the reach or the like, coverage um, of topics is pretty broad. Uh, for example, IOSCO, this is nothing else um, uh, but, but an organization that, that gathers representatives of the local financial regulators or uh, securities uh, regulations around the globe, including the US SEC, the UK's FCA and others. FATF um, is, a, is an organization that deals with anti-money laundering and, and counter-terrorist financing, which uh, this is the one you probably heard about because it was uh, there were some um, some some developments here, and there are a few others, right? Each of them focus more or less on on a specific goal on a specific area. Um, so you you can see that there is you know this cooperation is quite strong, even if you look uh, just on the number of organizations that are dealing uh, just with that, and this is a thing that that also is uh, like has developed uh, very rapidly after the financial crisis, uh, where when everyone saw how much the global financial markets are interconnected, uh, and, and there was this need for international global response. Uh, but these are not regulators, right? These guys, none of them uh, can adopt like binding usually binding regulations for for people like like myself or you or any DeFi projects. They are setting some uh, standards that are then implemented in in, in uh, by, by jurisdictions, and these guys, all of them, all of these guys that I that I listed on the slides before, they are dealing with crypto assets already. So here you can see um, uh, a passage from uh, from a paper by the Financial Stability Board, which is a major uh, major body, international body that is uh, that is tasked with with looking over the global financial markets and seeing. Uh, you know, some risk primarily, especially to st financial stability. This is the, like the role of this of this body is really important after the financial crisis. Erhin, you can see that um, they are working on a number of fronts directly addressing issues arising from crypto assets. They are mainly focused on investor protection, market integrity, anti-money laundering, bank exposures, and financial stability monitoring. Uh, FSB is a kind of coordinator of, of this work that is being di done by all of these bodies. And the passage that you can see here is from the paper called Crypto Assets, Work Underway, Regulatory Approaches and Potential Gaps. And this is, you know, this is a paper that is basically an outline of, you know, like a summary of what these what this, what this guys, what this organization are currently doing uh, in this space. Which is very interesting because you can see that this work really accelerated in the past months, like most of these papers by these bodies uh, are, are from the last year. It, it, it's really clear that the topics um, uh, that are important from our perspective are on these guys' agendas. Uh, and mostly this is about crypto assets, but we can see a very uh, clear evolution here as well, because first they were dealing with virtual currencies on, on a on a quite uh, well, like in a quite limited scope. Now it's about crypto assets, and they're defining them pretty broadly. And it's 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 both issuance, secondary trade, and and every possible other aspect. But they are moving into DeFi as well, specifically. So there was a paper by FSB a few months ago um, that dealt with uh, can't remember exactly, but I think it was called decentralized financial services. 
or decentralization of financial markets. And they're you know, defining it pretty broadly. It's not necessarily just about blockchain systems that are talking about various things like peer-to-peer -peer lending outside blockchain, so like this traditional peer-to-peer uh, -peer financial services. Yet this is like the topic of decentralization and decentralized finance is on, on the agenda uh, already. Uh, and one example uh, of, 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 a specific, uh, of a specific organization um, that, is dealing, that is dealing with these topics uh, pretty actively, um, most actively so far, is, is uh, Financial Action Task Force that you might already know because uh, like many people in the, in the crypto and DeFi space were talking about the consequences of the recent, of the recent FAT development at, at the FATF level. Basically, there is a new recommendation uh, that has this interpretative note, which, uh, which was followed by another guidance, which aims to cover new developments in the crypto space uh, and, and try to capture these developments, appropriately capture them um, with, with some AML tools. And here we can see, uh, again, in yellow, that uh, this is from their guidance, that they are, they are, you know, they are talking specifically about dApps, uh, they mentioned decentralized exchanges uh, in the context of being subject to uh, AML rules. Um, so far, this is a general conclusion that I'm going to make because this guidance is very long and we're going to see how it you know, develops, how the interpretations develop. But so far, uh, it's, it's coming in a pretty, pretty interesting right direction because they are, due to the American presidency of FATF in the last year, uh, there is there, there is quite clear heavy um, heavy influence of, of the American recent American FinCEN state um, uh, FinCEN, uh, opinions and statements on the topic, uh, and we can see some interesting thoughts about, for example, non-custodial services being outside the regulatory perimeter of of, of uh, AML laws, which is interesting, right? Because DeFi is, is very often like no, non-custodial solutions are are at the heart of DeFi, right? Which is, which is not necessarily bad. It's not that these guys wanna come and you know, impose all of the AML obligations or on all DeFi. Uh, but again, this is just the beginning, right? So we are gonna see how that develops. And just following on this example, just to show you how these things develop, like as I said, this is not binding for anyone, right? This is just what this, peop what this guy said. Uh, develop certain recommendations that are then, you know, being made available to to all of these states that are participating in this in this in this organization, and that these states are expected to take certain action and to implement these rules into their local legal systems. As I mentioned at the beginning, this is how it works, right? These are the only players, the sovereigns, who are able to do so uh, and adopt binding laws. And this is sometimes it's becoming super super complicated because you have multiple layers. Of, of various regulations or you know regulation like statements. Um, so first you have these recommendations which are super brief, right? This is just a very small passage. Uh, then followed followed up by by a guidance which is a much longer document which is not a recommendation so it doesn't have like this this force of recommendation yet it is very influential right because it provides the let's say official fat thinking about the topic so we don't have anything about defined fat recommendations right but you have uh, quite a bit of defi in in the guidance and then specifically here in Europe you have first uh, an AML directive that is gonna follow and implement these recommendations. And then this directive is gonna be implemented in the local laws, right? So here you can see that it's, it's very complex, but especially in the, uh, with the topics that are so you know, fresh, uncertain, uh, that are not obvious, that are very dynamic, like DeFi, for example, right? Which, which is like develops really rapidly, it, it changes, uh, changes um, uh, each month. Uh, you, 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 we can see like these multiple layers, and uh, you know uh, they. First of all, uh, people might be confused, right? Because all of this, like at the end of the day, all of all of this boils down to some interpretation, right? Does my model, uh, business model, or, or technological model, falls under the, the new regulatory framework or not? Um, and here you can read, you know, various things. Like this is this is an obvious thing that you, if you have multiple layers uh, of, you know, something that is written in natural language, that's obvious that you'll have some differences. And also, uh, you know, 
this this layer this layer structure also means that at the end of the day, at the level of each individual country, you may end up with slightly different uh, uh, regulatory framework, which which is happening. I mean, which is which is basically true in many other sectors, and in this one in particular. And we can already see that even before these FAT recommendations will be. Um, Will be uh, will be implemented in, in in all of the all of the countries around the globe. Uh, we can see that with the old AML directive in Europe right now, that it's being implemented completely differently uh, across the whole EU. You may have heard about uh, the recent steps by Germany uh, regarding specifically custody over crypto assets and some strict rules that would require you to, to hold a uh, hold a license if you want to do that. And this is happening in in, in all of the all of the member states that they have this general rules in the AML directive, but first they are interpreting the, the, them directly or are gold plating, so going further than the, the directive says. Um, which all of that is becoming, becoming super, uh, super complex. Um, and you, you see that, that even if the whole world, like all of the major states, all of the major economies agree on a specific, specific point, that doesn't mean that at the end of the day, at the end of the day all of the players uh, in all of these countries would be regulated differently, which, which is, of course, uh, a big problem for, for DeFi, which, which provides mostly uh, some global uh, products and solutions. So just to sum up this part, there is uh, hardly anything like uh, global financial regulation and the regulatory cooperation uh, regarding f uh, global financial markets is quite strong, uh, especially after the financial, financial crisis. Uh, and we have standard setting bodies dealing with these topics already. Um, yet, uh, and they have, yeah, they have started uh, approaching DeFi, yet this, um, Yet the, the overall picture uh, is, is, is much more complex. You, you hardly have any you know, consistent, consistent uh, uh, view on how that's going to be uh, managed. And now moving to the second part um, of my talk, because right now, uh, so far, I only focused on, on, on this regulatory point of view. And now, uh, from, from the strict DeFi perspective, first, a few very general point. So the first, the first two are, is that different from finance? One uh, very smart answer um, I, I heard from, from Vinay Gupta, who was asked about the relation between finance and DeFi. He just replied that uh, finance is DeFi, or finance is going to be DeFi that works, right? Which underlines the difference that we are talking about DeFi you know, uh, the question is, is, is that something different, conceptual, than what we, what we are dealing with, um, with in the, in the tra on the traditional financial markets? Is that something, like, something completely new, or just using some, some, uh, some new technologies to deal and, and tackle the, the same economic problems? And the second question, is, that really, is it really decentralized? Like, we know this, this vision of, of fully decentralized finance, right? Without any type of intermediaries, without any type of trusted third parties. But we already know that in practice, it's, it's very difficult, right, to come up with such solution for many reasons. If the, even if it's um, uh, possible for, for uh, technological reasons, it, it might be very difficult to build a business model around this. So in, in, at the end of the day, we see many hybrid solutions. And if they are hybrid, if they are, you know, come, like place themselves uh, somewhere in between uh, traditional centralized finance and decentralized finance, you know, we have this question, is it, is it the same business and is it the same risks? Because if so, we're going to have the same rules. Um, and I would, I would, like, in the morning on, on the plane, when I was thinking about this, I, I thought about, um, you know, there, there is a long list of regulatory issues that people are facing where, when building um, DeFi projects. Um, and I, I, I thought about dividing them into two, two types of problems. The, the first one is uh, immediate problems. So those that are, uh, you know, that people are facing uh, all the time, uh, people that are building such products. Uh, and first, it's about digital securities or, or, or that we see hardly any digital securities or, or security tokens uh, 
uh, you, you may say. I'm going to get to that in a second. Uh, we have issues with custody, uh, like specifically legal issues um, that, uh, you know, non-custodial solutions, even though they might be better from technological and business perspective, there are certain limits uh, in the law with regard to, to how, how these apply. And we might t touch, touch on this topic on, on, um, uh, on the panel of, after the lunch break, the MAMA panel. Uh, we have the, uh, the question of the legal status of, of TAS. Uh, which is, you know, we have many possible answers, uh, but again, they are coming from various jurisdictions and, and we don't, you know, we don't have like a clear picture uh, how that would gonna work. And we have fragmented regulatory frameworks and here I'm, I'm not just saying about the, the global, the global uh, regulatory framework because we already know that nothing like that exists and it's highly fragmented. Uh, but I'm talking about you know fragmented frameworks in specific countries or, or jurisdictions like money transmission laws in the US or as I mentioned AML AMLD implementation in, in, in the EU. That's just you know you have you have just one jurisdiction, right? Yet the uh, the picture is going to be completely different um, in some cases in in, in some in some uh, specific regions. Um, and these are. These are types of problems that people are facing all the time, yet uh, I think that these are solvable problems. Uh, that it's just a matter of time until we solve them, because sometimes it's just about adapting the regulatory framework to, to, to respond well to these issues, right? We have an incumbent, incumbent laws that are just not uh, good at tackling these problems, uh, but that doesn't mean that they, they, they wouldn't change. And then we have some, some fundamental problems, uh, such as responsibility, global jurisdiction, no sovereign, this is how I call them. I'm gonna get to them in a second. But first, um, a, a bit deeper diving into digital securities because you know, many uh, DeFi project, projects and, and products that are being built are about building some new types of, of, of financial infrastructures, right? Um, that would that would uh, you know at least have this ambition of of replacing or creating an alternative um, uh, to 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 the existing the, the existing infrastructure of the financial market. Yet you know there are hardly any digital assets other than crypto assets in the space, right? Very often these these products are being faced in a situation that they want to really. Uh, you know, they want to see uh, actual real assets from traditional world to be traded, um, to be present basically in this, in, this, in, this new, in this new products, but they are not, right? We are lacking this. Uh, we, we have a certain problem with tokenization, so bringing these real assets into the DeFi world. Um, and this, this has a few reasons. So first of all, in many countries, we still have a very heavy concept of paper certificates as the only allowed form of, of security. Uh, we have a certain conceptual um, barrier uh, or, or, or issue with registered versus, uh, versus bare instruments. Like most of the, of the assets that are on the financial markets right now are registered um, uh, in, in, a, in a very general meaning, registered instruments, meaning that you do not have like the real property over the instrument. You rather have a claim to someone else who is actually holding this, this instrument for you. Whereas in, in the crypto world, in DeFi, we have this focus on bearer instruments, right? So if you have your private key, you are the only owner. Uh, you have the property, let's say, over a certain instrument. And there is like, this is a clear, like, conceptual barrier that is also holding, uh, holding this tokenization, tokenization movement. Then we have public versus private securities, um, uh, which is, which is uh, not present everywhere, uh, not, not really uh, in Europe, for example, but it's a certain problem in the US that for private securities, it is much easier to issue them, but you have to fulfill many other requirements that are sometimes hardly transferable into language of technology. Um, and also, you see some very interesting developments that I, that I called here light at the end of the tunnel because we, we can see already, for example, first ERC20, pure ERC20 uh, security token issuances such as, such as the recent uh, bond offering in Germany. Of course, there is some legal complexity involved because we had some, like we, we, had, we, we, we saw these this headlines 
in, in the news about uh, bond tokens being offered uh, in, in Germany as pure C20 tokens, which is you know, really complex because these are securities for regulatory reasons, but not necessarily securities within the meaning of the civil law, which brings some, some limitations. Yet, you know, we already see some, some really interesting developments in the space. And this is the type of the problem that I think is, is totally solvable, right? I mean, paper certificates, for example, right? We already know that they have limited sense right now. It's just about, um, which, is, which might not be easy, right? But it's just about um, updating our laws uh, that, would be, that would be able to respond to this type of problems. And perhaps, you know, hopefully all of these are solvable in a, and in a few years of, of for na from now, we're gonna see a very strong development and there, there wouldn't be any more this obstacle of bringing actual assets from traditional finance into DeFi. But we also have this um, fundamental problems um, that like this key uh, legal issues in decentralized systems, uh, which is about, you know, they boil down to some questions like who's gonna be responsible um, in a decentralized setup, right? Who, who would be accountable uh, if there is no central central operator of a system? Or how to, how to approach uh, these systems from this traditional jurisdictional perspective if this is about building global reality that exists on the blockchain and does not have uh, specific links to any particular country? And there is no sovereign, right? So there is no one we could reach to and, and, and say reverse the transaction. So these are these really fundamental, very interesting legal questions that are not necessarily immediate problems of DeFi projects, yet they are somewhere out there, right? And the question, uh, one of the question is, is about the proper regulatory method, right? We already know that we can, you know, this is, this is like, uh, every day at financial markets that you can regulate, or even broader, that you can regulate certain institutions uh, or certain types of activities, right? You can, you can like, uh, uh, like refocus regulation from the institutional approach to, to certain activities. Um, we don't have time to, to, to elaborate on this. Uh, but again, you know, in, when we take this idea of completely decentralized systems, which there's this question if they, if they exist at all, right? Uh, we, we have the question, you know, how, how, how can we regulate that? And there is this possible conceptual clash between the state and how it operates today um, and, and, and this type of systems. Uh, and this is, you know, there are serious, serious doubts if these are types of problems that are solvable right now, as opposed to the ones that I just described. These might not be, you know, so immediate, but they're, they're you know, they're still out there, uh, and it's still open. I'm sure that we are going to see, uh, we're going to see some interesting ideas here in the, in the coming years, uh, and we already see the, the, you know, popping up. Um, and these are out there, and ultimately, uh, you know, uh, DeFi projects are going to be faced with with these issues as well. So uh, my perspective on, on these problems is that first, the first one, it will be dealt relatively easy by individual countries, right? It's like, for example, paper-based securities, this is a matter of local civil laws, uh, which are specific, usually specific to, to a given country, and these countries will, will, will just start tackling these problems if they haven't already. Uh, and the same, the same goes with, with all the other topics. Of course, they will be, you know, influenced by each other, uh, but, you know, these problems just, just, just will start, will, 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 will start um, to be solved. With this type of problems, I think that you know, as I said, this is about much more fundamental issues. And this is the area that uh, I expect much closer, like coming back to the topic of the first part of my presentation, much closer global coordination of, of tackling these issues, especially if DeFi takes off, right? We can already see that with, the, with this limited um, size of the space, very limited when, when, when compared to the traditional, traditional financial markets, we already see a strong interest of, of standard setting bodies at this international level, right? And this is just gonna be, uh, this is just gonna go, go very quickly if the DeFi space, as we all hope, um, is, uh, is gonna take off. Um, I'm gonna add here, many thanks, and we have five minutes for questions, if there are any.
another one here. Not sure if it works. Perhaps it's ripped off. I don't think this one works. It does. Yeah, that's right. Um, Um, specifically around the FATF recommendation 16 with the wire transfer rules for cryptocurrency um, and the switch from the presidency of the FATF from the US to China. Do you have any insights? Uh, I mean, it seemed like I think the, the open discussion on the floor was, uh, you know, the, the, the Americans are doing everything they can to slow down cryptocurrency adoption until the banks can catch up. And now that's kind of been moved to China. Do, do you have any insight into uh, if that adoption is going to be changed? Uh, we've never seen FATF kind of go back on something that's been passed, but in this case, maybe. Um. Um, so um, I do not have any specific insights. Uh, I just think that the recommendation is out there, and this topic is specifically mentioned in the interpretative note, which forms the part of recommendation. Right, so it's not something that might be changed easily. That's not about something that is just in the guidance and just pure interpretation. Right, it's in there in the recommendations. So I do not expect that this, you know, there will be any any kind of, uh, you know, um, like this topic will not be abandoned and it's out there already. Right, many countries already started implement implementing this. We're gonna see how they're gonna do that. Right, that's that's a, s a separate topic. But I think that. At least, to my knowledge, that's going to stay at the FATF level. That's that's what I would expect, and will be tackled somehow by by individual jurisdictions. So yesterday in the panel, some of the questions were about um, developer liability. I was wondering if you see any discussion at the international level about developer liability and. Um, at the domestic level, where you, whether you see certain types of laws that could pose more legal risk for developers or certain countries that put, pose greater legal risk for developers. Yeah, that's that's uh, certainly the topic that is out there for, for a longer time and people are, are like uh, really wondering whether that's going to be uh, true. Um, I would say that uh, at this international level, I haven't seen any mention of this. Uh, but that's because I'm not sure if, if these guys already, you know, like switched their minds into, into this topic. So, you know, they're in this, this older mindset of regulated institutions, right? And they're approaching these activities. But it's clear from, from some of these documents that even though they mention dApps, for example, they're saying about, you know, people that set up dApps that, that um, you know, that are using dApps, right? That might be uh, that might be subject to some requirements. I do not think that it's 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 because they think that developers should be. I just think that there is this old uh, mindset that there is always someone behind a certain type of activity, right? So um, we'll see how it goes. Uh, but I think that what is much more practical and and dangerous to in some meaning uh, to, to developers is the local civil laws, right? And using some old civil law theories to bring someone to, to liability. Uh, but, but again, I like since, since this discussion started uh, a few months ago, or maybe last year, I haven't seen any news about this being actually uh, used. So certainly a topic, but we'll see how it develops. Uh, certainly a topic for academic papers as well. Hi. Um, do you think there's any uh, possibility of the UN or uh, the World Trade Organization um, making a play for some kind of international jurisdiction for this stuff? Uh, or do you think that the international level is just going to leave this mess to the nation states? Um, think of maybe a 10-year horizon. You were late to, to the talk, right? A bit. Uh, yeah, two minutes. <laughs> came, came in about 10 minutes in. Okay. So, like, at the beginning, like, I, I, I devoted the beginning of my presentation to, to, to this issue of, like, global financial regulation and how it looks like in practice that there is some co cooperation of, of sovereign yeah, states. Yeah, I called that part. Yeah. So, no, I don't think that that's going to that's gonna become true. I mean, look at the old world. Like, this, this, like all of these countries have, have basic problems if you're agreeing on some much more fundamental things, right? Um, so I, I, I expect that this cooperation is going gonna, is gonna to accelerate. Mm. But even if the, in the old financial industry, we see many, many, you know, like differences between local frameworks, even though they, 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 they should be quite the same. I, I was thinking the counterexample is the International Telecommunications Union. Mm. 
which has you know, succeeded in getting massive amounts of global power over things like the internet and satellites um, with very little resistance from the nation state level. Um, so I just, I just wonder whether there are different sets of dynamics there that may play out. But if not, not. I do not know this uh, telecommunications sector too much, but I think that one thing that I did not mention is that in many sectors where the global cooperation is much uh, stronger, like telecommunications, that's, uh, that's not just about uh, like pure law, pure regulation, that's also about setting some technical standards, right? Uh, and here I think that that makes the difference, uh, that like so far here, like in this, in this uh, co cooperation over, over regulating financial markets, there was, there was hardly any mention of, of, of technology or technical standards, just pure law, just pure regulation. And perhaps that's gonna change, right? That the countries will move into, into like being interested into how all of, all of this works uh, technologically and would, would agree on certain approaches based on technological setups. And that's something that's interesting direction I didn't, didn't think about when I was making these slides, but that, that might happen. Um, but still far away from global government, I think. Which national uh, uh, regulatory environments are pushing the envelope the most, in your view, and how does the UK compare in that mix? And do you think the momentum of the one that's going best is going to continue or, for some reason, slow down? Um, Good question. Uh, I, I think that we would need another hour at least to, to discuss uh, this topic. I would say that, uh, like, first of all, um, I wouldn't focus so much on small countries that are being mentioned for a few years, but are being mentioned uh, most often in this context, like, like Switzerland uh, or Malta or others. I mean, these guys are sometimes doing a cool job, right? But, uh, you know, still, you know, look where the def where DeFi develops right now. It's 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 mostly the U.S. from my perspective. This, this is where like uh, major projects are based right now. Even though everyone is convinced that the U.S. has so strict approach to these topics, right? So I think that there are like many not so obvious, um, not so obvious aspects of all of this. And also, I'm not sure if if you know any country should should react with. Um, with like, you know, complete changes to the legislation, right? Uh, I'm not sure that's gonna work. What's, what's gonna win is, is the like maturity of, of, of local markets and openness to innovation, right? Uh, just to answer in, in a super general well, but happy to discuss after, after this talk. I, I think that we are, uh, have, are we still Can I fine? Sure, go again. One more I mean, question? For me, that's completely fine. What are the three biggest risks, legal risks for the Maker project right now? For the maker project, yeah. I don't know if there are any. You know, <laughs> let me answer in this way. Okay. Finished. Okay. Thank you.